My name is Pradeep. I work at MathWorks as a senior UX specialist. Uh, prior to that, I've been working at startups and product companies as a UX specialist. I worked at a telco as a customer experience manager, and I started my career at a UX consultancy as a designer. Now, uh, the insights that I'm sharing in this talk are primarily from my experience working at these product companies and startups where I was either the first UX designer hired to build up a team or the only UX designer or a team of one working on these products. Now, traditionally, uh, there were businesses and customers, and UX team was the glue in between who brought the customers' insights back to the companies, and that's how we work. And in a way, uh, UX designers' role at that point was like that of a great people to keep the bad design choices away from the customers. Uh, but Jeff Gothel, uh, one of the leaders in Lean UX, says this, that a company has to believe that user experience is part of a broader uh, recipe for success. And what that means is, and we've started seeing a lot of companies where the divide between the businesses and the customers is coming down. And you have UX as a glue, still in glue, as a glue in between, but there are other departments like your marketing, your customer service, of course they are, and product managers, everyone talking to users. And where our role from a gatekeeper is now changing to that of somebody who supports the orchestration of uh, resources to build better products. Now, this is not something new. This is Don Norman based on his experience working at Apple. In Kai 95, he said that's what the UX team does where he says we describe the role of user experience architect office, which works across the divisions, helping to harmonize the human interface and industrial design processes across divisions of Apple and ATG. Now, it's important that everybody in your company understands and knows uh, UX design or you know the importance of it and how to apply it in the products and services they're building. Now, when you think of it, uh, most often when I work, uh, Case an example, when I was working at uh, Telco, there were 40 product managers and six UX designers. We could definitely not support every single one of them. But you know, how do you work across that? So that's something that I could talk about. Uh, in a key takeaway, all I want to say is responsibility of delivering a delightful experience cannot be with a single person or a team. Now, these are survey results from UX uh, career survey from NN Group in 2013. But these are the top 10 UX activities done by UX designers. Now look at the number two over there, persuade others. This is not persuasion for your customers or the users, but this is persuading your managers and your developers to build what you're trying to sell this or stopping them from doing bad design. Now, to do this, I have two questions. What new skills as UX designers do we have to develop to work to persuade our developers and managers? And what new processes allow us to do our work more efficiently? Let me start with the first. I call it inward empathy. We UX designers are great at doing research. We talk to our customers, we talk to users, we do in-context inquiries, we do usability tests, and we do that to build empathy. Uh, a short note, how we see people necessarily is not how they see themselves. So we need to figure out, we need to feel the pain that the customers are experiencing using our products and services, and we convert this back to our developers. Now, why don't we apply that back in our workplace? We are good at understanding pain points. We are good at understanding others' perspective. Why don't we start using this skill of building empathy towards our teams that we are working with? Here are a few things that you could do with your teams, things that work for me. Knowing the team's mission and objectives, knowing what they're trying to do helps you to integrate better with as a UX designer in the project team. Understanding their goals, their task flows, their pain points. The task flows here are not the task flows of the application, but the, you know, they are also doing the task. They're building code or they're building, they're deploying code to a server. What are the problems that they're facing? How can you help them? There may be a few tricks that you could help solve their pains, thereby uh, gaining their trust while you're working with them. <coughs> Practice active listening with colleagues in cross-functional teams. When people feel heard what they're saying, the more chances are that they're going to hear when you speak to them. Right? And then know when to push or pull back. You know, no matter what you say, the product is going to ship. And especially if you're in a product company and which has tight deadlines, <coughs> whether they has design is just only a part of it, right? There's the business viability, feasibility, and a lot of other things. And they're going to ship the product, whatever you say, you can keep shouting, but the train has passed. So you need to know when to push, when to pull back. And 
As for the second part, what new processes allow us to do our jobs more efficiently? Now let me put that in two big buckets, the research and testing phases and the designing phases. Uh, I'm sure we all record our usability sessions, we generate huge reports of what we are doing, and then uh, your managers, product managers, or your team managers, they're like, oh, you're going to record, right? I'm going to see it tomorrow, or send the report, I'll uh, you know, read that later. But that never happens. You do your research, you get your insight, you're trying to talk to your team, and they're like, no, this is how we're going to do. But you would know, be like, hey, did you see that video? The users really struggled to do that particular task. But they're like, what video? Right? So they're never going to look at that. So in a way, when we record these videos and send them to that, we are actually you know, enforcing them not to look at it, and we waste a lot of time afterwards convincing them things that we need to do. And a few things that work for me involving my project team in the research and testing phases. And especially when uh, we get volumes for research, we get not just for the budgets, but also the project team's resource time so that they can participate actively in the research or as observers in usability tests so that they're right there seeing what's happening with the particular product in use by the users. And at MathWorks, we highly discourage UXers to do video recording of the UX test unless you need it for your personal use. This is not a report that you're going to share with them. Uh, a case study from Grambling Phone. Uh, this was the telco I was working with. Uh, so this was the case where there were 40 product managers and six UX designers. So we kind of like mod, uh, help train the product managers and few developers do moderation to do collect uh, insights from the actual field. And where these guys were doing the data collection, we were once in a while checking at what insights are coming in, how are these insights being channeling into the products and services. Uh, the benefit, it really drastically reduced the time to, from idea to execution. And if anyone of you worked at a telco, usually from idea to execution is two weeks. And as simple as, you know, five rupees, 500 SMSs is a product for them. And they're going to act fast on it. Uh, again, at MathWorks, we only do uh, usability tests when we have at least one project team member sitting in the observation room observing it. Advantages, no more long hours of report generation, which is a side effect. But the main effect is they have the aha moments right there while the usability tests are happening. And no more trying to go and convince them what to do and what not to do. Now, as for the design part, who owns the design? Uh, so I've heard various different things from people in the last couple of days where sometimes it's the product managers who own the design, sometimes it's the UX designers. But let me take the case where UX designers own the designs. Uh, I've had this case, even for a tool like Balsamic with very low entry barrier, uh, you even, after you share, uh, you know, we use my Balsamic, it's shared with everyone, everyone can go and make edits, but they'll come to you and say, hey, can you make the uh, small edit that we discussed so that the design is all okay? You can do that as well, but, you know, these tools have an entry barrier, nobody is going to put in effort to learn them. So, in a way, uh, what worked for me again is moving the ownership to the team of the design and only keeping the responsibility with me as a UX designer. Let the team create the design artifacts, create uh, prototypes, whatever, and we only use Azure or uh, Balsamic only to document these designs digitally but not necessarily to share it with the team because the team is part of designing activity. They know what to do already. And your design tools play a major part in this. You will have to think about are you using the low fidelity uh, prototyping tools or high fidelity prototyping tools. I personally like the low fidelity ones, like paper and whiteboards, because everyone can jump in in a workshop to start creating your prototypes and talk about them. And another thing that helped us in our previous product startup that I was working with, as part of requirements gathering, we had the UI developers sit with it start iterating, building in the browser itself, designing in the browser. That kind of like drastically reduced the time to understand or going back and forth on the requirements because we could show them, this is what we understood, is this okay for you? And then this was like a spike for us. We either threw the code away or we started building again, but there was no misunderstanding in terms of what worked or in misunderstanding in the requirements, basically. Uh, so I'll take a case study of Engagement HQ Mobile. This was a company I was working with prior to MathWorks. Uh, they are a SaaS-based web product for governments to deploy websites to engage with local communities. They were very pop they are very popular in New Zealand and Australia. They had the web presence. They wanted a mobile presence. I've just joined them. I had a hard deadline of 30 days 
uh, to get out a demo because we were at an industry conference and we wanted to get some feedback at that point. And this is a journey of how we went from day one ideation, demo in day 26, and before three months we had the final launch. Uh, so on day one we had, oh, I'm sorry, of the fonts, but basically we had a workshop on day one which included the product manager, a couple of backend uh, developers, a couple of frontend developers, CTO, and myself where we went through brainstorming, affinitization, storyboarding, and paper prototypes. It was a long day. Being in a startup, we could afford to have all of these people come and work as a day-long workshop, uh, like how Google Ventures talks about it as a studio for the team. That's what we did. And at the end of the workshop, we had the problem and the pain points clearly defined. We had a rough draft of the project plan with priorities in terms of what we are building and how we are going with it and everybody could see eye to eye in terms of what we are trying to achieve. And then we got to work and yeah, I didn't do any wireframes for this after the paper prototypes. They were our oracle or the truth by which we were building it. But we did need a visual design. Again, we did a hack over here. We knew there were going to be banners, thumbnails, a few types of text and text boxes. Of course, there are the radio buttons and things like that, but these are the most prominent ones. We built a stencil to see how things fit together, we fit the language, and within a design language, we kind of saw what works for us. Of course, this was iterative, this changed by the time the final product came. But it was a good start, it gave enough inputs for the developers to go and start working, not waiting for the actual uh, components to come to actually build them. So the way we built the demo, we fixed on a couple of features that we want to have the experience on the mobile. All the rest of the things, like say for example, if you click on FAQs over there, it would load up a desktop page, but that was okay for testing and as a demo experience. But some of the big features were all prototyped, they were all built into this demo. And in fact, we had a couple of uh, beta testing customers deploying it to their live sites to see how mobile works. And that gave us a lot of insights in terms of what worked, what didn't work, what design elements work. And we went ahead and by the time we had on day 86, the final launch, we totally refined the visual language, we refined the interactions, and it was a huge success, and we were out in the market in three months, less than three months. Uh, so again, when you're trying to uh, teach your, or convey some parts of your skill sets and knowledge to your team members, there's always this dilemma that, you know, what is my role if I start teaching my developers how to design? Uh, and this is not just us, I've heard multiple times this coming up in the workshops and talks over here. And this was also asked by a colleague of Jared School. Three weeks back, he blogged about it saying, you know, some user experience skills are always better than no user experience skills. With no UX skills on the team, there's a good chance that whatever the team produces will have poor UX, probably close to 100%. Any designs that aren't a poor UX are just accidents that work out in the user's favor. So I urge you to start involving your team in designing, in kind of running workshops, designing wireframes, prototypes, so that they already know what's coming up, you're all on the same page, and you're able to uh, reduce time in convincing your developers what to do, but take the journey on to build world-class products. And I think I have time for one question, and I'll answer with no, it depends. Sure. So, um one, one comment, one question uh, about the influencing. I think you're exactly right on with those points. Um, that's if, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years in this field, it's that influencing internal teams is really important. Question: You talked about an internal kind of participatory design exercise, and I think that's that's great. Do you guys ever do that with customers as well in the mix? Uh, Users. So it depends. <laughs> So I'll say it depends over here, <laughs> for the reason, because if, uh, while it's a startup, it was easy to get the customers to talk about it. Okay. Currently at MathWorks, uh, there's a whole lot of NDA stuff going on, so we couldn't disclose what's coming up, but we do involve customers when we kind of do workshops to identify their current workflow. But for future workflows, we use surrogates who are internal engineers who know the workflows of the customers, and that's how we work around. And, and what, how do you find the sort of differences between the internal only folks and, and when you've got the actual customers in the room? Uh, how, 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 more, how uh, do you get to uh, a better result more quickly than the users are 
present. Actual end users always better, but I think we are a little fortunate in case of Matchworks because our uh, customer facing engineers most of the time spend time in the customer location. So they kind of like imbibe, they know the culture, they know the workflows. So it helps, sort of helps, but any day working with the customers has provided much better results.